Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Mondays with Mate. Today we have here with us Chris Porritt, Hi. who is our new uh, Chief Technology Officer or CTO. Chris just joined us recently, he's still in shock I guess, <laughs> <laughs> coming from bigger companies to, to a fairly small one, uh, but doing big things and punching above its weight. Uh, so Chris uh, you know, and I uh, clicked immediately because we both are car guys and that's really important when you work in the EMATS and especially when you work directly with me. <laughs> and Chris has done a lot in his career. So Chris, again, welcome to EMATS, welcome to the Thank episode. You, yeah, so a uh, little bit of background from me. Yeah, please. Um, so I started my career in Land Rover. Uh, I was a sponsored student there. I worked there for 10 years, moved from wasn't there. Wasn't Leyland at that time? Uh, no, it was, uh, it was actually owned by British Aerospace when I started there. Okay. Uh, then moved to BMW and various other people along the way. Um, so I moved then from Land Rover to Aston Martin where I started then doing whole vehicle engineering. At Land Rover I actually just did vehicle dynamics but it gave me a good background for the whole vehicle stuff. So I moved into whole vehicle engineering at Aston Martin. Uh, and I was responsible for the architecture for DB9 and V8 Vantage. Uh, so we built the architecture, this went to the designers, designers draw beautiful pictures, uh, it then becomes beautiful models, ultimately ends up with beautiful cars. Um, so I was 16 years at Aston Martin, so learned everything about the business through vehicle engineering, program management. Uh, I was in charge of the 177 project, which I think you've seen. <laughs> yeah, I think you said you quite One of like my favorite car. hypercars. <laughs> Um, Ever? That's probably, I thought that was the sort of highlight of my career. Well, we'll see, there's some more exciting stuff to come. Um, and then I moved from Aston Martin to California. Um, so I went to Tesla and that was my intro into electric vehicles. And the thing that excited me more than anything, because at that time, Tesla was relatively small in the world of, of automotive, but obviously very big in EVs. Um, and I knew a little bit about it, but the thing that excited me more than anything was when I drove a car. Mm. And I think once you've driven an EV, it's very difficult to go back to an internal combustion engine car because the, the inertia of the, of the powertrain is so slow compared to an EV. And that's the thing that I said to Elon when I went to speak to him, I need to drive a car. If the car's compelling, then I'll come and try it. <laughs> so actually similar with you, I didn't drive a car beforehand, but very soon afterwards we drove a car and it's pretty damn compelling. Um, I then had, uh, I was at uh, Tesla for three years. Uh, I then had a period of time outside of the car industry working at a for high a technology company. company. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then we talked when uh, really I, I, I wanted to come back to Europe anyway uh, for family reasons and uh, see friends again. And I felt that, you know, my time in California, it was time to have a change and we connected and everything sort of worked out. So. Here I am at Rumatz. So far, so good. So far, so good, yeah. So the 177, like it was, you know, some of the details on that car were just, you know, it's the little things that got me. Like there's a little window when mm -hmm. you look from the back yep. where you can see the monocoque and a part of the monocoque and the suspension, like the, the, the dampers. Yeah. That was yep. really, and when you open up the front hood, similar like with the, with the front uh, suspension and so on. So like these little details, I think, it what makes a difference. difference. Yeah, absolutely. And, and everything, I, I think we said at the time, there was no B surface. So normally in, in, in the car world, there's A surface, which everybody sees and touches, and then there's B surface, which is everything underneath. Uh, and we said, on 177, there's no B surface. Actually, there sort of is, but you don't see or touch those B surfaces. So we wanted to make sure that everything, even under the hood, was, was really, really cool. Yeah, but well, I think even the parts that nobody will ever see, yeah. or will see if they do something really stupid with the yeah. car. Yeah. Uh -huh and get it into pieces, then, you know, even those parts have to yeah, look good. That's right. And I remember even things on the engine that weren't visible. You know, we did beautiful machinings on the engine and we, we had a book that we uh, we uh, produced for 177, which included a lot of the detail parts that you would never, ever see. And they were beautifully made. Yeah, it's but like ours. Was, yeah, it, it, You know, it's, it's even cost efficient because those, uh, you know, a lot of paintings are more expensive than that's right. 177. So you just... But that actually <laughs> was, the, was the rationale behind the one of because every single one was unique. So, yeah. we, you know, like paintings, you commission a painting, you have one of however many, and that was the reason for the 177. It was one of 77. So you said driving the car was really important. And unfortunately, because we have so few cars currently, uh, a lot of people here work for years and unfortunately didn't have the opportunity <laughs> to drive a car yet. And you came here the first day and drove two, two cars. cars. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> How no, was that? It was great. Oh, it was amazing. Yeah, it was really, really cool. Um, 
In, in, in my time actually at Tesla, and I had a conversation with one of my ex-colleagues just the other day, I always said that the electrification is the perfect application into a supercar. And I always said that in my career, and now having worked on EVs, I wanted to do that. I actually owned a Tesla Roadster for a period of time, and that was pretty fun, but it was fundamentally flawed in some areas. But to then go and produce an electric hypercar, that was like the next yeah. dream in my career. And so that's, that's what we're doing. So. What do you think are the advantages of, like, and disadvantages of electric hypercar against the combustion engine? Instantaneous torque is, is just huge. I mean, that gives you the opportunity in any EV to be able to do things that you just can't do in an internal combustion engine car. Some people might say like, you have maybe a thousand uh, combustion engine horsepower, so why would you care if it comes a little bit later, you still have plenty. It's so long to spool up in comparison, and, and it's very easy, you know, you can build a car with very, very low inertia, you can build a car with uh, very light powertrains, very low um, drive train inertia, it's all of these things but it still takes a time from the combustion process to get to, through the conversion to the wheel to give you the propulsion. Whereas in an EV, it's just instantaneous because the inertia is so, so low in the, in the drivetrain system. Um, you said there's advantages. Advantage is clearly that. The other advantage is, you know, it's, it's way more environmentally friendly. Um, you know, we're not going to change the world because of the few number of cars that we're making, but to get people to have very special cars that have very low emissions as well, or zero emissions in this case, is huge. Um, the downsides are it's heavier. For no question, it's heavier. Um, the, there's some uh, challenges associated with making sure crash performance is good because we have to treat the battery like an occupant. Um, we, we can't damage that because of, of potential after effects. So um, that's a challenge. Um, there's another upside in that you, know, you can package the heavy things, generally the battery, in low positions. So center of gravity can be low, which means actually you can get much better vehicle dynamics performance than you would do for an equivalent uh, internal combustion engine car. So and you can lower CFG weight. and distribute indeed. Yeah. So you, you can not only lower the CFG, but you can also decide what the, the your inertia is going to be like um, and you can place things accordingly. So we, you and I talked a lot already about the future yep. of what you're going to do. So, yep. you know, what they say that, um, you know, in the auto industry, Usually, how it goes, you uh, recycle. So you start with the existing model, you modify it, you improve it. The new model is a little bit different, or maybe looks quite different, but under the skin is actually the same car. With the C2, we start from a blank sheet of paper, and that's usually like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. But um, in Rimac, we can't say too much. And, <laughs> you know, Chris wouldn't have come here, I think, if it was just about, you know, finishing the C2, uh, which is quite in a mature state. Yeah. But I think, you know, the projects we have in mind, and it's not only one, it's several, uh, are quite radical. And I don't think that's what people would expect from us. There will be some surprises, right? There definitely will be some surprises, yeah. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, I mean, there's, the biggest surprises are actually going to be from some of the people in our team who don't know about what we're doing next as well. Yeah. And they shouldn't be learning about this on the video, but they, they'll learn about the details before everybody out there, clearly. Um, but yeah, that's really exciting. Um, and were, I think, were you surprised? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that was part of the carrot you gave to me to come join you here at Rimats. But I, I think it's a logical progression for a company that's growing as quickly as we are to, to, to take on a challenge as exciting as that in the future. Yeah. So we are trying to bite off a lot more than we can chew sometimes, but it's going to be interesting at least. Never, never boring. <laughs> yeah, there always has to be a challenge, doesn't it? Otherwise, yeah. as you say, it's boring. So, exactly. Yeah. But it's yeah. not just about, you know, I guess, power, endless power, like we are already 1,900 horsepower with the C2. Yep. So what else do you think matters? Well, I think now, you know, on a first car, you clearly with C1, you learn something. And there was a lot of things that you learned were, that were good things. There was a lot of things that you would change. So similarly on, on C2, we'll learn things. Uh, we'll learn how to work with some suppliers at, at the volumes that we're working with now. We'll learn what's good and what's bad about that. We'll learn about the technologies that we've deployed and what we might do differently. And with the team that we've got, we can actually refine that a little bit now. You said earlier, you know, normally car companies work one thing and then progress um, in a sort of evolutionary way towards the next thing. Um, we should make sure that the things that we want to learn, we carry forward and we don't forget. It's very important to make sure that um, you, you don't make the same mistakes twice. That's, that's hugely important for time, for cost, for uh, customer quality, that's really important. So we need to make sure that the things we learn, we, we make sure we sort of write down and, and, and make sure we don't do them again. Simple as that. I mean, it sounds really simple. It's much more complicated <laughs> when there's 2,000 parts on a car or, or more. 
So uh, yeah. But it's not, it's not just about pushing the, you know, better and better numbers, like faster and faster acceleration, higher and higher top speed. It's also about, you know, making a great driver's car. Yes. And I think, I think as, as we learn about the, the C2, we can, we can continue tuning it through the process that we still have to finish off. Uh, but I think as well, that'll allow us to be able to uh, maybe position the next car in a slightly better way. There's some opportunities in terms of refinement or in terms of, you know, absolute connected feel or instantaneous response from the throttle or, you know, tuning torque vectoring that we can maybe uh, develop over time. Aerodynamics, there's always going to be some things there. Uh, we're going to learn, we're going to do um, verification of our cars, we're going to make sure we correlate all our CE models, so the models will then be better for the next time as well. So that means that we can actually get into the next model quicker, with a better le level of integrity at the beginning, which means then better product ultimately later as well. So that's all about learning that whole development cycle. You were seven weeks in human time in Limats already. Yeah, which feels like about five months. <laughs> yeah, so it's dog years here. Yeah, it's yeah. A, space is, space time is wrapped here in Sveta Nedelja in Croatia. So first impressions, be, be I, honest. Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, it's dreadful. <laughs> no, I love it. It's, um, I've met everybody in my team now. So I've been around to talk to everybody in the team uh, to understand the, the capabilities and also the passions, the enthusiasm, what they, what they do. Do they do it well? Are they better doing something else? So that's an important thing from the team. Uh, but the biggest, the biggest thing that gets me is is the technology that's deployed in C2 and all of the all of the um, detail that's gone into the design. So the fact that we have CE models that are running, uh, especially in crash simulation, we're doing crash testing now. We're doing a great job of that. Every single test is working exactly as we predicted, which is phenomenal for such a new company. Um, the C2 itself, when I drove it. Um, there's, there's little details that need ironing out, but the fundamentals of that car are just amazing. It is so fast. And I know we didn't have full talk on the day that we drove it. It's incredible. I'm really, really looking forward to when we have full talk and I drive it again, hopefully later this week or maybe next week. Um, and just see how the progress has gone with the, with the, uh, with the tuning. Yeah, with well, a lot of small and little things like Chris and I are talking a lot about the little, you know, that's what I love about uh, Chris's approach is uh, like looking from a customer perspective. So it's not just about, you know, meeting the big targets, like getting the car homologated or into production, but also like, how does the button feel? Yep. How does it feel when you close the door? Mm -hmm. Like, where do you pull the door? Is it maybe easier for the customer to do something else? So uh, it's also about those little things. And it's important that you have the team who recognizes those, mm -hmm. those little things. And, and some people um, like, um everybody has different approaches in life. Some people can recognize when things need to be altered. Some people think that you know, good enough is good enough. We don't have many people who think good enough is good enough, by the way. So uh, <laughs> otherwise you'd be, you'd be having a word. But um, so I think making sure that people understand that, you know, the bar is really high for a, a product like this and um, that, that, that we should be striving to do the best that we can in, in everything that we do in, in, you know, the door closing that you touched on earlier on in the ceiling, in the, uh, the, how the seat feels, how the steering wheel feels, how, you know, the, the leather on the steering wheel as we were talking about the other day. Um, that's all important as well. And it's those details that make the difference for, for cars like this. And what do you think about the approach? I mean, you have seen now how much we do internally, mm -hmm. both in development and production and design and everything. So my philosophy was always that, like try to build up, not just for the company, but also for Croatia, like to build up the capabilities that didn't mm -hmm. exist here mm -hmm. in a country that never had a car industry. Yeah. So. And, and for me, coming from a, a country, uh, the UK, where, you know, you've seen a lot of the suppliers there, where the capability is really on the doorstep. Um, coming to here where the capability isn't on, on the doorstep, it's actually inside the house. <laughs> That's really, really good. Um, there's, there's some areas where we need to learn ourselves. You know, we know that. So uh, we're new to a lot of things. But that gives us amazing flexibility and it allows us to be able to reduce some of the development times. So for example, the fact that we make the wiring harnesses in-house, that's fantastic. Wiring harnesses are always the most difficult thing to get frozen, released, built, and into the car before you put anything else into it. Because it's, it's always the first thing or very nearly the first thing that goes into a car. And that's when the supplier says, okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm gonna hold these guys to ransom now. Um, so, you know, we're, the only people we're holding to ransom are ourselves. So, and the guys that build the harnesses over in VT, I can't say the name, by the way. I can't pronounce it. Veliko <laughs> Trgovišče. Yeah, that's easy for him to say. Um, so. Well, what's the name of the project manager? 
Oh, don't say that. I'll call her schnitzel again. That's not really good. Schnitzel. <laughs> schnitzel. Uh, there you go. I can say it now if I'm not under pressure. Um, so yeah, build, building wiring harnesses in-house is really important. And then our little upholstery shop that we have. So we trim steering wheels ourselves. We, and that allows lots of flexibility as well. So steering wheels we do, um, all the dash panels yeah. and everything like that. Battery well. pack, power mm. train, yeah, carbon yeah. fiber, all that. Uh, and machining is also like you can do really quick. Quick turn. Yeah. Turn around. You know, the guys release it to today, tool to uh, finish tomorrow in the tool shop, and day after tomorrow you have the carbon fiber part. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What do you think would be the technology focus in the next few years? Like until now, it was like you know, electric cars were still something new, mm -hmm. especially in the high performance segment. Mm -hmm. So now we come to the point where there is more, more electric cars coming. Mm -hmm. Some of them uh, have our technology inside, which makes us very proud. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Let's say electric cars in general are not a novelty anymore. So what's what's the next thing? I, I think the biggest thing that we need to do is is learn better integration of things. So we need to we need to make our systems more efficient, and that's that's you know from things like gearboxes through inverters through. Um, battery packs even, but also in, in, in my world of the bits that I know, the mechanical bits, it's, it's about making things do more than one thing where possible. So if we can use a structural member to you know, pass um, coolant through or a structural mm. member to pass um, airflow through or something like this, that's a huge benefit because then you're not having to design two separate things. The other thing I think with EVs, there's a, there's a direct proportional between aerodynamic efficiency and the whole vehicle efficiency. So uh, clearly, if you're driving at reasonable speed, as some of our customers will be, um, they want to be able to drive the car for as long as possible. The last thing they want to be doing is stopping charging all the time because you know that's just time that's wasted when they want to be driving their car. So I think we can learn more and more on aerodynamics and, and, and uh, benefit our customers that way as well. Um, we have Active Aero already on C2, which is amazing, the things that we're able to, to change on the car from the front lift balance, the rear lift balance, the overall drag to the ride height, everything. There's a, a huge uh, plethora, big word there to try and say that, <laughs> <laughs> plethora of tunable items there that we can work with. Um, and I think, you know, uh, us, us again, refining our models more in, in aero allow us to be able to start from a good place to start off with and only get better. The way we did the C2 has a lot of advantages and I think it's very compelling in some ways. Mm -hmm. But I think the approach that Gordon Murray take, uh, took with the T50 mm -hmm. also had, has a lot of compelling uh, ways to it. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Could you uh, imagine an electric car being done with the principles of the T50? Is it still too heavy? I think there's, there's clearly there's the, the, the thing we need to decide to start off with is what range do we want to have and what driving conditions? Because we can decide that we have a shorter range, we can take you know, battery volume and therefore mass out, and we could have a more focused, more focused car. But if that means then that it actually doesn't fulfill the requirements that the majority of the customers want, that doesn't work so well. But I'll, I'll touch first on, on C2. It's, clearly it's a, it's a technological showcase. It basically throws together everything that you could think of that you could put into a, into a car and it's a really compelling mixture of all of those things. So it appears to people who have got sort of intuition, if you like, and want to, want to explore that. But I also think that it, it definitely appeals to the petrol heads, if you like, because it's got brute performance. Um, I think there's probably an opportunity to make a, a lighter weight version of a C2, maybe as a derivative or something like this that we should look at and maybe in the product uh, plan, um, that then is more focused. Um, so we should look at maybe what opportunities we have for mass reduction in various areas. And we know now, having produced C2 um, in the prototype phase, that there will be some opportunities. So, you know, not to say that I wouldn't buy a C2 now, I think there's maybe C2 now, which is all the whistles, all the bells and everything, and the cherry on top. But maybe we, we take the cherry from on top and we make an amazing cupcake that, you know, is appealing to maybe a different type of person or maybe a C2 customer wants another thing as well. Um, but yeah, there's an opportunity there for sure. And you can make it more focused, take some of those, those things out, and it's a different type of product. And during the development of a car, you always uh, recognize those opportunities like, ah, we missed an opportunity there where we could have made the car better, lighter, more powerful. How, how do you like say, okay, I accept this, we are going to do that on the next car? I, well, first of all, 
we're a business. <laughs> so we have to sell product to allow you and I to carry on playing with the things that we enjoy playing with, that's cars. <laughs> um, and the second thing is that we need to have customers in our cars to give us feedback of what, what they want. So we have to be able to get a product out there to, to try that. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is you, you can't get to step two without doing step one. So we're doing step one. Step one is we're making our, our first carbon fiber hypercar. Once we've launched that, then we can think about how we improve it. Um, and if you don't do, as I say, if you don't do step one, you can't get to step two. Um, it's like walking and running. You know, you don't go straight from crawling to running. There's very few people who do that. So there's, there's, there's steps that we need to take to do the right thing for the company, to do the right thing for our customers, and, and for the team to learn and figure out where we're going next. So and then you have a base to go yeah, absolutely. from there. And we know that the fundamentals of, of C2 are phenomenal. The carbon fiber structure is amazing. The guys in here did an incredible job designing that. Um, you know, we've got all the analysis techniques to be able to do whatever we need to do with it next. Be it, you know, mass down, cost down, performance improvement. You know, we've got the tools to be able to do that for the future. Not like this tomorrow, but, you know, to develop what we have over time. And, you know, I was telling the guys that were working here, especially at the beginning, like, uh, it's usually, like I said earlier, once in a lifetime opportunity to develop a car from scratch mm -hmm. and a car that really leaves a mark. So the C2 has many firsts. Of course, we had this, the Concept 1 as the first all-electric hypercar, but the C2 is globally homologated. Yeah. It will be produced on a higher volume. It's on a totally different level in terms of quality and performance and so on. So. These guys here, in the middle of automotive nowhere, <laughs> had the opportunity to do that. And I, I, I'm, I was also going a little bit back again to Gordon Murray. Uh, you know, he, he built the F1 30 years ago, mm -hmm. and his career is still defined by doing the F1. Absolutely. So I kind of hope that, you know, of course I hope for everybody here to have a great career, mm -hmm. regardless if they stay in the company or go somewhere else, yep. but that, you know, their career will be uh, defined in a big chunk by, by the C2 and yep. this incredible thing that we have done together. But I hope that they will be, or that's the plan, that they will be also not by far the last time, or actually very soon, we would be doing projects on a similar scale. Mm -hmm. So oh, to have several times the opportunity to once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> I know lots of people that worked on the, on the McLaren F1, some came to Aston Martin, for example, and um, they said it was, it was a phenomenal thing. Uh, to work on that car, so focused, um, so pure, so exciting at that time. And these guys here, they're, they're excited to work on, on C2 and get that into production. I don't think, as you said before, they maybe wouldn't be here otherwise, but it'll be the start of their path on their career in a lot of cases. Um, for many of the guys, it's the first job. Absolutely. You know, some have come from college straight to here and some have come from all sorts of backgrounds. I've known you're chatting to everybody, all sorts of backgrounds. There's, there's, there's very few people that have got, you know, deep experience in, in the automotive world that have come here and done it. Uh, and given the amount of experience that there is in the team, it's incredible what, what we've done. Absolutely incredible. And, so, you know, I, I, as I say, I, I, I just saw the car and it, made me excited to come and join you. So. <laughs> yeah, but still a long way to go. We have still a few months before start of production. Yep. It will be some tough months yes. for everybody here. Tough months, long hours. Yeah, but we can't lots wait of, for other of, people to try it. Blood, sweat and tears, yeah, as blood, they sweat say. And tears. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I forgot to ask you, Chris. So we were together in the UK last week. We spent yep. uh, some uh, uh, cool days together. And one thing that uh, you were very excited about, and I was as well, was to show me your cars. <laughs> yeah, well, I, over the years, I've collected a, a few racing cars. Um, the majority of uh, uh, the cars that I saw racing when I was a kid. So from the 1970s. <laughs> so, uh, and I used to go and watch these cars racing with my dad in, in the northwest of England um, at Alton Park. And... So I was drawn very much to Chevron racing cars because they were built in the northwest of England. And so I have, I have two Chevron racing cars, a, a Formula Atlantic and a, a Chevron B19 sports race car, uh, which I raced in America. Uh, and I've brought those back here with me. So I was glad you were able to see those. And then my sort of my, my more mundane but still exciting racing car is a, is a 1970s Formula Ford, which is also built and designed in the UK. 
Um, and hopefully I'll be racing that if you give me a little bit of time off. <laughs> I'll be racing that in November um, at Silverstone. So that'll be the first time I drive cool. that car actually. But super simple constructions, like yeah. you can yeah. play yourself with the geometry of That's the right. suspension yeah. and can repair everything with a hammer basically. <laughs> I, I try to not to use the hammer so much. But the, the, the majority of the cars that I buy, I buy in either a condition where they need a lot of work or they need a little bit of work. Because the first thing I do is when I, when I take it back home and, and put it in the garage is I pull it all apart, learn everything about it, put it back together. Because what I learned in doing vehicle dynamics was to have a picture in your head of what the car's doing when you're driving it is really important. Because then you can feel, you can, you can think about what, what part might be moving, what might be causing a problem, what might be giving you a good steering feel. And then you build that sort of mental model in your head before simulation um, a little bit maybe build that mental model in your head and you can then start tuning it and thinking about what you do next in the, in the tuning uh, program. So I do the same with my racing cars so that when something happens, if it feels slightly different, I know that it's not quite right. So I can either stop, repair it or think, ah, what the heck, it's not important, I'll carry on. So that's, that's the reason why I buy those cars and I race them is so that I can keep the little bit of feel in as well. Okay, Chris, so the next few weeks, what, what, what gets you excited? Uh, we've got to get through our crash test program. That's, that's really exciting uh, in a good way and a bad way. Um, crash tests never always go perfectly, but we're, we're on a good trajectory there. So, um, and they're very expensive things to do because we're crashing very expensive cars. Uh, we've got a very good plan, so we need to get through that. That's really our, our path to get to a car to a customer. So we need to get all that homologation work done and that's really the biggest part. And then the next bit is, is tuning the cars. Um, and driving and uh, spending some time making sure that everything works as we want it to. So that we've got good steering feel, that we've got good um, refinement balance, that we've got good ride comfort, that the active aero works if we expect it to, that you can drift it, obviously. Um, Very and, important. <laughs> and so that, yeah, it just, we need to make, make, need to put all of our effort into, into making the car feel like a complete thing as opposed to a, a, a bunch of parts that have been put together in a really well, a good way, but we just need to make it have a homogeneous feel, so, which yeah. takes a lot of time. So hopefully that's going to happen over the next few weeks and we can start giving the car out to other people to try it so you, that you can also see how it drives, not just from our videos, but also from other people trying it. Uh, that was it for this week's episode. Uh, you are very welcome to ask us any question and maybe some specific questions to Chris. Sure. Then when we talk next time, uh, we can answer our fans' questions. Uh, okay. I'm sure they'll have many of them. Uh, you, of course, you can ask him about his cars or <laughs> about his time in the US or how it was designing the 177. doesn't have to be just regarding uh, Rimac. Uh, so I'm sure that you will see very interesting things coming from, from Chris. And, and, and we, we always need more people in our team. So oh, if we've yeah. got any budding engineers who, who want to come and work in the team here, Croatia is a great place to be. It's really exciting. Um, Zagreb is a great city. Uh, the people are really friendly. You Very didn't, direct, but you didn't really go, friendly. Yeah, you didn't go to the seaside yet. I, I didn't go to the seaside yet. You, I need to yeah, a little bit, bit of time yeah, off, maybe. But yeah. <laughs> so maybe next summer I'll go to the seaside. But yeah, I mean, it's only an hour and a half away to the seaside. So yeah, it's a great place to be. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thank you.